You're about to join Niels Kostrup Larsen on a raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Richard Brennan and I, Niels Castro Larsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global markets through the lens of a rules-based investor. If you're new to the show, I hope that today's episode will trigger your curiosity enough to check out the back catalogue and listen to the past episodes that you may have missed, like my conversation with Alan last week, where we went through many of the behavioural challenges investors face when they have to choose a manager for their portfolio. So you should definitely check that one out. Also, um, if you missed our Wednesday episode in the Global Macro Series, I would strongly recommend that you listen to the one we just uh, published as it featured one of my own favorite podcast hosts, Grant Williams, and where we managed to touch on many of the most important topics that the world is dealing with right now. And oh, then Grant added a little bit of spice at the very end of the conversation. But you need to know, go and listen to that episode to find out what I'm referring to. Richard? It is fantastic to see you. How are you doing, my friend? Very good, Niels. I, I was saying to you last month how um, the rain had stopped, but it decided to open up again. So we've had another month of wet. And um, yeah, we, we, we're looking forward to a bit of sun if that ever comes. But also we're sort of heading into winter. So uh, yeah, may, maybe we're not going to have this opportunity for the sort of the Queensland sun. So um, yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> well, true. But you are the son of Queensland, I guess. <laughs> All righty, okay. Uh, since uh, Rich and I uh, are recording a day early today, it's Friday, and it is Unemployment Friday report today in uh, the US. Um, but we're recording just before the numbers. Actually, the numbers will be released as we're recording. But if we miss something and the markets are completely different to what we're going to be talking about today, um, then you know why. Uh, first off, we got a few things um, that obviously is happening at the moment. And just as a quick uh, recap of what's going on um, from my point of view, it is really the rising inflation. And it's very evident when you look at the numbers being reported both in the US and in Europe, uh, where we're seeing inflation headlines of, you know, eight, eight and a half percent. And at the same time, we have the European policymakers dealing with the fact that Russia is turning off the gas to several European countries at the moment, whilst the Europeans in kind are implementing even more sanctions. And then, of course, you have the issue of Turkey not letting Sweden and Finland get an easy uh, way into NATO, which is uh, making things uh, very interesting. And then something turned up on my screen uh, yesterday, and I think this is really interesting. It turns out that there is a massive amount of divergence between the lowest and the highest inflation rates within the eurozone, the 19 countries within the euro. Um, and the difference between the lowest and the highest now is 14%. So in one end, you have Malta, where the inflation is, quote unquote, only 5.6%. And on the other end, you have Estonia, where the inflation rate is 20.1%. So clearly, these countries don't really need the same medicine to tame inflation. Yet, the ECB only has one interest rate that they can change uh, and one monetary policy that they can set. And I think this is going to create even more tension in the whole euro project, which we um, you know, we may not have seen anything like this so far because, of course, ever since the euro got launched, inflation has been so modest. So this will be another test of that whole project. And uh, to round things off, maybe uh, it's not just in Europe. Things are, are, are interesting. Uh, the U.S. Fed and the Treasury uh, had for officials out in the last few days, again, coming out with, quote unquote, diverging statements to say some to say the least and a few truths. For example, we had Secretary Janet Yellen admitting on May 31st that she had been wrong last year in saying that inflation would pose a continuing problem and I quote from the article or from the interview I didn't fully understand the unanticipated and large shocks stemming from supply bottlenecks apparently she told CNN and then at the same time you had Fed Atlanta president uh, Raphael Bostic uh, he said that his suggestions the week before that the central bank would take a pause in September from raising interest rates shouldn't be construed as a fit put 
and believed that the central bank would come to the rescue of the markets. So that's kind of interesting. And then finally, you had Fed board member Christopher Waller, and I think his term runs all the way to 2030. And he's quoting for saying to the Wall Street Journal, I support tightening policy by another 50 basis points for several meetings. And in particular, I'm not taking 50 basis point hikes off the table until I see inflation come down closer to our 2% target. So no wonder the markets in May uh, was a little bit uh, confused. Um, We'll see what happens over uh, over the summer. Those are some of the things that I picked up, um, but I have to say it's been a busy week, Rich, so I may have missed quite a lot. What about yourself? How are you doing? You got the rain. How's the battleship? Lots of things going on. Well, the, the battleship took a breather in May, so um, it had climbed this massive ascent and um, it sort of put out a few tents and it's had a bit of a rest for May. But interestingly, in the last few days, it's gone back into trend again, uh, continuing on with some of the... Um, the good performance I was I was seeing originally in in you know some of the forex trades um, and some of the um, the energies and um, so yeah it seems to be coming back again um, with a bit of life and you know it's very interesting how you know in the last you know quite a few years we sort of had this period where we expected almost a, a large retracement after these glorious gains that we had but at the moment uh, we we just sort of seem to be entering plateaus before it takes off again so hopefully that continues yeah that's true and from a market perspective when you are invested or trying to invest in these type of markets because i fully agree it's really hard to get into the position you want because it never gives you a chance. You're sitting there hoping to, quote unquote, buy the dip, um, but it never does give you that option. So I think maybe people are still not positioned the way they want to be in some of these commodities in particular. I think they have the conviction. I just think they're short the positioning, so to speak, um, which will be uh, interesting to follow. Um, since we just finished the month of May, maybe it is worth just uh, spending a little moment on that uh, from a trend following performance point of view i completely agree with you performance eased off just a little bit in may nothing too dramatic from the early numbers that we've seen um the continued uncertainty and shortages in energy uh of course provides fantastic opportunities uh within the energy sector and i think trend followers made the most of that the u.s dollar weakness on the other hand probably was where we had some down pressure and also uh, equities, depending on your time frame. I mean, uh, long-term managers versus shorter-term time frames may have had a different result in um, in the equity sector. Um, on the other hand, I don't think that there are some huge exposure in equities right now from a trend-following point of view. And then elsewhere in the fixed income sector, that was quite interesting from my perspective because I think that people would have experienced um, – you know, European fixed income markets doing fine. And then in the US, uh, you probably lost some money. Um, So a very clear divide, mainly because in Europe, they're now starting to talk about finally uh, getting out of the negative interest rates from the ECB. I mean, I wonder what they're waiting for. But anyways, and in the US, of course, I think people maybe felt that they had priced too many rate hikes in because of some of the statements we had in the last uh, few weeks. But now with the changes in, in, in even the rhetoric from the central bank, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not so sure other than that uh, we're going to see renewed pressure on U.S. fixed income markets when it comes to price. Anyways, metal, soft grains probably lost a little bit of money in May. Um, but I think meats, if for those who are exposed to meats, that you had a little bit of a gain in that. Um, so anyways... Rich, we have so many questions. I don't think we've ever had so many questions for one episode. So let me be, uh, you know, very upfront about it and say we're going to do our best to get as many as we can done, um, and then we'll 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 keep some. I'm sure we'll have to keep some because there's one or two topics that you brought along that I think is important that we do want to touch on as well. Um, so um, so let's just. Uh, jump right into it um, and see where we go. First question that came in is from John. Uh, and John has been waiting for a few weeks because he, I think it came in just after you were on last time. And John writes, on the last episode, Richard mentioned that he varies his initial stops and trading stops. What methods does he use to calculate these? That's the first question. Yeah, well, thank, thanks for that question, John. Um, 
I suppose I, I engage in this pretty comprehensive workflow process, which um, rather than setting my initial stops and my trailing stops uh, from you know a discretionary basis, I use the data to tell me how to place my initial stops and trailing stops. But I don't just use the data associated with the return stream that I'll be trading. I also use um, a vast array of, of different market data as well to uh, basically ensure that um, that initial stop and that trailing stop do not just respond to a single market history, but they respond to multiple possible different market histories. So in, in that manner, um, when, when, for instance, uh, for my trend following models, um, I apply an ATR based initial stop and an ATR based trailing stop, um, I'm applying that across perhaps um, 30 different alternate possible histories to um, basically tell me um, which is the, the, the best combination using a very loose pant methodology because it's not responding to a single historic market regime. It's responding to many, many different possible regimes. So it's very loose pants. And that therefore uh, means that I'm using the data to tell me where to um, place them as opposed to any form of discretionary judgment. Yeah, no, cool. And by the way, let me also say that today, maybe Rich and I have to be a little bit shorter in our answers than normal, because otherwise we won't get through all of these questions. One thing that just in my mind that actually, and I don't know where we're going to get to a question that asked this this particular point, but something I thought about when you just talked about it. And by the way, for those who don't know, when Rich talks about loose pants and you think, well, I must have tuned into the wrong channel because is this fashion or what are we doing here? When we talk about loose pants, we actually just talk about the fact that we are very, um, we want a, a large, uh, we want to give the markets a lot of leeway. Uh, in terms of where our initial stops and actually also where the trailing stops are. So uh, if the market retraces, we don't get stopped out too soon. That's what we mean by loose pants. And by the way, it's a Perry Kaufman um, quote, by the way, that we're, we're, we're butchering here uh, and, and have done for a while now. But anyways, my question to you, and I was just thinking about it, do you think the pants can get too loose? Because you know, too loose pants don't look good on people. So what about what about trend following? Perhaps they can. Um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, for instance, I would regard a, a trend-following program that doesn't have a trailing stop, in other words, just uses their initial right. stop and has some form of profit target. I'd say those pants are a bit too loose for me. That's just personally for me. I like um, having a trailing stop that at least um, in relative terms hugs price so that um, – yeah. You know, um, we all often talk about the give backs, you know, when the, the trend turns. And, um, you know, I, when, when I've made uh, my windfall with some of these trends, I, I don't like giving too much back. So I do like having right. some sort of trailing mechanism that is, uh, whilst it's loose pants, it's not the loosest pants. <laughs> no, and I think maybe for clarification, Rich, we should say that we have never advocated for using profit targets nor not having a trailing stop and only having an because an initial stop in theory you never move it so you're going to lose right. money at some point right so i mean there's no point in having that you do need the trailing stop um so okay fine that was just a, a thought then we have a few questions from abe and um, i'm not gonna necessarily go into all of the details because i think then that's probably not needed but let me give you some and let me raise the questions that um came to mind here um abe writes after having listened to ttu's great back catalog of content in full thank you Abe. <laughs> that, that is a mean feat for sure I have begun to implement the basic trend following model. I trade three products at a, at, at a time only, selected quarterly, preferring greater liquidity first and higher volatility second. And so my chance of catching an outlier move is very low indeed. Despite this, I found the results of backtesting and live trading to be quite satisfactory. My trading costs are low. Up, I'm not forced to um, use costs, costly CFDs. Okay, I think it should say, so I'm not uh, forced to use costly CFDs, which I would be if I had to a typical 50 uh, plus markets. And my number of trades is relatively small, so I don't cross the spread that often. I don't need to trade illiquid products or take part in questionable regulatory regimes 
China, for example, or trade products that could be um, could be zeros um, like Bitcoin. Okay. It had been said on TTU that diversification is the secret source of trend following, but I'm not sure um, there is a secret source at all, as trend following without broad diversification is clearly profitable on its own. Okay, fair enough. Um, And then you have a few questions, Arbe. You say here, are we, as a trend following community, focusing too much on adding ever more markets? That's one question. Do we need outliers at all? Does adding esoteric products increase tail risk, counterparty risk, regulatory risk that won't be captured by our backtest? Can we not benefit from trending markets without diversifying, just as other traders benefit from diversification without trend following? And finally, should we not put a greater emphasis than we currently do on reducing transaction costs, especially if we uh, expect spreads to widen in the future? perhaps due to socioeconomic turmoil, fourth turning, etc. Okay, so in the uh, in the being mindful of the time, um, how would you respond to that, Rich? I've got a few smaller comments, but how would you respond Look, to that? Um, the the question comes down to how do you define trend following? And um, mm. I, I, I see what Ave is doing. He's using a, a much more selective process than I'd use where he's, he is selecting the top three performers on a quarterly basis or something like that that he was mentioning. And then um, his, his back test is showing him um, very good performance. Now, Look, in my definition of trend following, that wouldn't be what I'd class as diversified systematic trend following. And probably the outcomes he's he's getting where he's questioning whether you need outliers, whether you need that degree of extensive diversification is because how he is deploying his model is not how I would deploy a diversified systematic trend following model. So um, I appreciate where he's coming from, but I'd just say that... Um, Whilst we we talk about trend following, um, as, as you know, in all of our podcasts, the arguments and the debates that we have over our, our models are highly nuanced. But when I'm, I'm seeing something that Ave is talking about, his model, I'm saying, in my mind, that is classing it as a different form of model almost um, entirely to trend following. Mm. I'd, mm. I'd say that um, Ave's model might fit more into um, what I'd call cross-sectional momentum trading, where you are. It's a selective methodology where you are um, only choosing a handful of the top performers um, based on their recent performance, and then um, using them for the next period. And you're continually rotating in and out of your top performers. I'm saying that that's more a, a, a that's a different form of process than what we apply with with trend following. What what are you saying, Niels? Yeah, so uh, if I see some commonalities, and I don't know if Abe, you are actually uh, referring to this, but when we had uh, Perry Kaufman on the show a while ago, um, he argues for this. He doesn't do it with three markets, but I can't remember how mar- many markets he trades, but he does select. I think every 60 days, I think he selects um, the new portfolio of markets. So it is a different kind of thinking. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, even though I think three markets seems incredibly more prone to lock or unlock, frankly. Um, But I completely agree with you, Rich, that this is not what I would define as trend following. For me, trend following is having a fixed portfolio of markets where, quote unquote, you're, you're always, you know, you always have a signal, even if the signal is flat, you always have calculated your signal, you know where you want to be in that position and, and you rely on this higher level of diversification and 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 not too much optimization, frankly. I think what you're doing, Arpe, relies more on some kind of optimization in order to select the right markets. And of course, I don't know how you select your parameters, but you know, hey, if you can make this work, there's nothing wrong with that. And we certainly shouldn't try and trade the same uh, way everyone, I think what it would fall into, uh, it sounds like, is just systematic trading, which is frankly the name of the podcast series. So I'm not I'm not too fussed about it really. Um, and so so good on you if you found something that works and uh, and so on and so forth. I do agree with you. 
uh, well, I don't know if it's if, if it's uh, I, I don't know what your position is on that. Um, where you say does adding esoteric products, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, well, no, I don't think you need to do that. I think you know, stay safe, stay on the exchanges. Um, there's plenty of markets you can trade uh, that are exchange listed. Make sure you have little liquidity. All of those things, um, I think, is fine. And what else did you ask? Oh, but about reducing transaction cost. Well, you know, it sounds to me like you might be more short term. And of course, with short term systems, we know transaction costs are important. So, of course, you should always try to reduce them. But for the longer term trend followers like the firm I work for, frankly, our total expense for uh, transactions on a yearly basis is somewhere between half a percent and one percent. It really makes very little difference. Um, so we're not too fussed about that. I know some. Some managers, so I've certainly heard about firms who make a big fuss about um, transaction costs, but I think that's because they're short term and therefore transaction costs are very meaningful. But for long term trend followers, it's not a big hurdle that we have to jump over every year. All right. Um, and by the way, thanks for your kind words. Uh, at the end, I forgot to read those, but I'm sure people are fine with that. All right, we're going to jump to a question from Zach. Zach has, in fact, two questions. Uh, he writes in, um, here are two questions for the next Systematic Investor episode. What techniques, thought processes, or process controls uh, are used by professional CTAs to ensure they follow their system rules during drawdowns? I recently rolled some positions, and now when I review my brokerage statement, positions that were showing significant open trade profits now have the potential to show large open trade losses if trends reverse back to my stop. This potential change to the PL statement has me considering what is needed to maintain focus and execute as planned during difficult times. And secondly, you ask, uh, Zach, which computer programming language is standard in the CTA industry? I've been running my system via Microsoft Excel for the past two and a half years, and now I believe I have the mental fortitude to stick to a systematic trading system. I'm considering learning how to program. Um, this is with the goal of automating my data entry and signal generation, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So um, I'll, I'll, I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, on this, Rich, but maybe just to, to uh, answer the first part of the question at least, you know, there's no technique other than discipline. I mean, if you are want to be a systematic uh, trend follower or systematic trader, you just have to follow the rules. Uh, I don't think there's any technique we apply other than the discipline to do it. Uh, and the commitment to our clients and to ourselves to do it. And I do think you bring up a good point, and that is, um, you know, how do you stick with it during drawdowns? And I, I do think that's a real challenge. And this is where investors need to be um, a, a little bit alert. Um, and, and this is where I think managers with a long track record of several decades that have shown that they can stick to their system through the difficult times – they should be applauded for that, even if it means they have some reasonably large drawdowns, but they've stuck to it and it usually comes back and, and they end up making new all-time highs. Now, during COVID, uh, it has come forward for sure uh, publicly that several, even some of the big managers, did not stick fully to their system because they they changed the risk levels. They reduced, for the most part, they, they stepped in and they reduced the leverage in their portfolios um, but that was a manual uh, discipline, or sorry, a manual intervention. Now, at our firm at Dunn, we certainly didn't do that. We've always stuck to just uh, the system and it gives us what it gives us. But it is something to be aware of because things like that will never show up in a backtest. So once you start not following your system, um, your backtest results actually goes out of the water or out of the window a little bit. Now, then you ask about this thing about the open PL and then you roll your contracts and then there's potential for don't look at it that way. You you need to just focus on where your entry was. Uh, so what's the actual PL from your original entry? And, and that's how you're going to measure it. Don't don't look too much about what happens when you roll because you're right. You realize some profits or losses and you open yourself up to, to others. But in your Excel spreadsheet, just focus on the actual PL from entry. Um, that's what I would do. And uh, and finally, in terms of programming language, I'm, I'm uh, interested in hearing your thoughts on that, Rich. 
I think a lot of uh, bigger firms use frameworks like MATLAB for sure. Python, of course, in terms of programming language, I know Rob um, Carver has done a lot of that. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's Python that he's uh, done, which is, I've heard that a lot, uh, people using Python as well. So, but again, the, the programming language is probably not the most important part you need to worry about. But if you can find a, a framework or a package that you know well, and where you can make it work for you, I think that's probably more important, whether it's called Java or Python or something else, uh, C++. I'm not an expert, as you can clearly hear. Um, then just make it work. Um, the systems that people have programmed for me in the past has been done uh, with Java language in a SQL, using an SQL database. That's much I can tell. I don't really know much more than that. So, anyways, <laughs> what about you, Rich? Maybe you need to uh, step in here a little bit. Yeah, so um, it, it was a good question. And um, look, one of the tricks that I do to um, – it, it's really important to reduce your expectation about low drawdowns uh, because um, – as your sample size increases, your drawdowns build. It's sort of, um, um, I remember Bill Dryce in your podcast, Neil, said that he operated for about 20 years with this relatively low drawdown and it was only in, um, you know, his last decade of operation he ever experienced 50% drawdowns. And this was a consequence of a, you know, a, a continuous extending sample size with an unwritten future, entering new regimes. Um, you've got to be prepared to handle um, big drawdowns. And uh, one of the tricks that I use to do that is that if I undertake a back test on a particular market over, say, a 30, 40 year history, um, I will inevitably find that uh, because it's a back test, uh, it's going to have this beautiful drawdown and this beautiful um, compound annual growth rate. And in effect, I'm using in sample data. Um, in, 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 I'm basically cherry picking. That's what I'm saying. My back test is a cherry picked example, which chooses naturally the lowest drawdown. So what I do is I then place that, that trading model on um, a different um, data set that is unseen for about 30 to 40 years. That gives me a totally different profile. And that's the one I use to give me expectations about what sort of drawdown you could expect over future data that is not a exact replication of a history. Um, so um, as we know, the future is unwritten and it's going to change. We're going to get variations to what's occurred in the past. So this is one way to, to test your models on unseen data to get the true volatility that exists in your portfolio that's not a cherry-picked example from your back test. So if, for instance, you've got a back test where it's showing you've only got a 15% drawdown, the reality is on this unseen data, you might very well have a 50% drawdown sitting there. Um, and it, this is a good way to reduce your expectations and build your tolerance because when you take your models into the live trading environment, it's good to know that uh, your models have survived over a 50% drawdown plus. Um, so when you're in that um, that regime, that hostile regime and your drawdowns are building, you're not um, tempted to turn off your models. This is just a natural thing that happens over a large data sample, over unseen data. Expect that volatility. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and this is another thing that I, I do think um, is, is very important um, because you're right. I mean, um, first of all, I loved my own conversation with uh, Bill Dries back uh, in, in the day. And and uh, as, as you rightly said, he, as well as, you know, us at Don and, and many others, we've had our fair share of, of, of drawdowns um, for sure. Um, but what I think is really important when people look at track records. I mean, obviously, I spent a lot of time with Alan last week talking about how to select trade, tra trend following managers or even any manager. And I think it's very natural when you look at a track record and maybe you have to compare 10 of them, you might get drawn towards the one that has the lowest drawdown because you think, wow, that is the safer one. Um, and but 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 something that's always stuck with me, it was a quote and it was something that I saw around the time when my son had his a cardiac arrest and 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 after that of course he has a quite a large scar right on his chest from from the surgery of course but i've always i've always said to him you know a scar is a sign of the fact that you survived 
right? Those who don't survive, they never get a scar. And I see that a little bit in trend following and in, in, in these track records as well, that those of us who have these large drawdowns, but we're still in it, it's a sign that we've survived these difficult times. So I see it as a sign of strength rather than a weakness, as long as, of course, the overall performance, and maybe we're going to talk about that later in one of your topics, as long as the overall performance obviously has to be has to be um, competitive and all of those things, but uh, drawdowns in themselves are not necessarily a sign of weakness. Um, so one should always be careful with that. And of course, we all know what happened with Bernie Madoff. He had no scars and no drawdowns, yet we all know where that story ended. So anyways, maybe to finish it off, by the way, um, would be to say that I would suspect as a rule of thumb, uh, sack, that a trend-following firm uh, or a trend-following system probably will have at least four to six times its monthly standard deviation as its maximum drawdown. So four to six times its monthly standard deviation as its month as its maximum drawdown. But when that is said, what I remember also is that back in 2013, when the industry went through a really difficult time intra-year, not so much for the year as a whole, but intra-year, the summer of 13 was horrible for many trend followers. And I saw, and I remember this clearly, that many of the trend followers, and many of you will know them because they've been on the program here, had their worst drawdown by like 50% expanded. So if you were typically for your last 20 years, you've had worse drawdown 20%, suddenly it showed up as 30%. So as, as Rich rightly points out, I mean, we can't put, you know, 100% reliance on our back tests uh, that they will be the guide in terms of what performance will look like and in terms of what drawdowns will look like. There is a reason why past performance does not necessarily reflect the future <laughs> results so anyways so anyways um all right quick question from troy troy wrote in um that um i think he's another aussie actually uh rich he says um quick question if you don't mind do you know the approximate size of the global funds management industry and of this do you know how much is allocated towards trend following community via managed futures funds i'm trying to ascertain whether the australian market is under invested in trend following um, what from what I can see, there's less than a 1.5 billion invested into local domicile managed futures funds in a 4.5 trillion size industry. Uh, I'm sure it's hard to quantify. So a general feeling would be great. Um, yeah. So Troy, from what I can tell, uh, the easiest answer is to say, yeah, everyone is under invested in trend following. I kind of, I don't even need to look at the numbers for that. But on a more serious note, I think you're right. Four and a half. I actually think that the, the five trillion mark is probably where um, you're going to find the uh, the total hedge fund world today. So I looked it up, and it says uh, from what I found uh, from Barclay Hedge at, that as of the end of Q1 2022, total assets under management for the hedge fund industry is five point one three six. Uh, trillion dollars, so five thousand one hundred thirty-six billion dollars, and the managed future CTA industry was three hundred sixty billion dollars. Um, I would guess, and this is purely a guess, that about seventy-five percent of the managed futures industry is probably trend following because we have short term which I really don't consider as trend following, even though we all make money from trends. It's just a matter of time frame, really. And there's some other stuff in there we we have. So maybe there's $275, $300 billion in trend following officially in the industry. Now, secretly, I think a lot of people apply trend following rules, even at the pension funds and all of that, in order to um, have some view on where markets are going to go. So that's my sense and the trend following industry has not grown for a long time. It's been hoovering around 300 billion, 280, 325 for many, many years. Of course, it's having a resurgence this year from performance and from some renewed inflows. Not a lot yet, but, um, but it's still pretty small compared to the overall hedge fund uh, industry. And by the way, the largest sub uh, strategy in the hedge fund world, so of the $5.13 trillion, seems to be something they just simply call fixed income as a strategy. 
Uh, as far as I can tell, it has something like $900 billion uh, in that particular strategy. Um, but there's some other ones like multi-strategy, $700 billion. Uh, long, uh, sorry, equity long only, $420 billion. Not even sure why that is a hedge fund if it's a long only. Um, so, yeah, some different some different ones. All right, anything you want to add to that or do you want to jump into no you, you you've the got the, the figures there and it was the only thing i would say is that in australia um you know the, i'd bump into quite a few people around australia um but very few of them have heard of trend following and they give me this bizarre look when i, I tell them what i'm involved with so I, I would say in australia it's particularly underrepresented so you know if troy wants to do something about that i think that would be fantastic if we could raise the the elevate or elevate the the name of trend following in the, the australian financial markets i think that would be a good thing you know, when I started in this uh, business uh, a few years in, there was actually an Australian manager that um, that was pretty well known. It just happens that it's so long ago, I can't remember the name, but I do remember <laughs> it was started by two brothers, and one of them was called Angus. I'm pretty sure of that. Um, and um, But I think they sold or changed the name or something, and I think maybe they were more short-term. Yeah, so, you know, but there are plenty of other managers to choose from so um yeah absolutely all right now we have a mammoth amount of questions from adam and uh, adam is also an australian it's funny that happens when you get on the show uh rich that the whole australia starts writing into us but there we are <laughs> okay so let me set the scene and adam just to warn you uh we may not get through all of your questions but then i'll keep them for either jerry or for when rich comes back um but i did want to honor your your efforts for writing in. Um, so we're going to tackle uh, as many as we can, and we're going to jump to some uh, cool topics from uh, Rich. Okay, so my name is Adam, and I'm from Australia, Perth. I've been a long-time listener of your podcast series and eagerly await the release of each week's episode. While being a dedicated listener, this is my first question into the show. Thank you very much, Adam. Great to hear. Before getting to my questions and comments, I just want to thank you and your guests for providing this quality content. I'm truly grateful for all of the insights and knowledge being shared. And note, this is my number one educational resource when it comes to all things trend following. Certainly appreciate those comments, uh, Adam. Thank you so much. As some background... I've been passionate about trading for quite some time with Van Tharp's book, Trade Your Way to Financial Freedom, making an impression on me back when it was first released. Ever since, I have been drawn to the concept of R, multiples, and systematic trading ideas. However, I never really understood how to put it all together into a strategy. It wasn't until I started listening to your podcast on a regular basis uh, a couple of years ago that I felt it finally started to all fall into place. Great to hear. My question as follows, maybe best suited to Richard or Jerry, um, and happy for these to be spread over various weeks. Okay, so you already anticipated this. Uh, uh, great stuff. Okay, you previously mentioned that it may be beneficial for smaller accounts who cannot leverage the diversification benefits of the strategy to allocate their funds to a professional manager. What are the typical minimum amounts required by a retail investor to be considered by a manager? Do you know of any trend following CTAs in Australia and any min minimum investment threshold? Okay, so that's an easy one for me to uh, answer. And I do agree that for many people, it's better to go, uh, don't go the DIY way, even though people think that I say that because I work for a manager and all of that, but that's really not the case. I'm only saying this because it is the best thing you can do for your money. Okay, so um, the typical investment amount, uh, I would say, Adam, for the Offshore funds, which Australian investors would definitely choose an offshore fund, not an US onshore. You can't get into those. So you would look for an offshore fund. You could look for a European usage fund. So that would be a European onshore fund. But frankly, they're typically much more expensive to, to run for the managers and therefore you pay more fees. Uh, not necessarily more fees, but more costs, I should say, for service providers. So... Uh, even though we offer you know, both uh, at our shop, I would say offshore fund vehicles are typically uh, cheaper and it gives you uh, also 
in some cases, more bang for the buck. They're more capital efficient because within the usage structures, you have some limitations in terms of the leverage you're allowed to use. So the typical uh, minimum investment for an offshore fund is 100,000 US dollars, which is for the most part, as far as I'm aware, uh, it is just dictated by the um, domicile of the fund. So the regulatory regime uh, in that jurisdiction, whether it's Cayman or Bermuda or whatever it is, uh, will usually say it's $100,000. And they do that to make sure that people um, have to have a little bit of capital, so to speak, and therefore they assume that that means that they uh, are sort of high net worth individuals rather than retail uh, investors. Um, and that's why they impose uh, these restrictions. Um, then you asked about any Australian um, uh, CTAs, and I'm frankly I don't I don't recall anyone in terms of trend following CTAs, and there are plenty of European and US managers to choose from. So I would just pick, go and find what you consider the best ones if you want to go down that route. Okay, so let's move on. There is a lot of talk about testing various ideas and back testing, etc., on the show. I have many ideas in which I would like to test, some tested at a high level, some not. However, given my other time constraints, I don't have the necessary time in order to fully test and progress to the next stages. Do you know of any services available in which someone can request coding, testing and supply a summary of the back test results for a fee on an ad hoc basis, i.e., for the testing of specific ideas, parameters, a, a basket of futures? Well, Maybe I'm speaking to one of those today. I don't know. Um, but I also know that people like Rob Carver is very generous with sharing his code, as far as I'm aware. Uh, I think he makes his, his code public if you're into that kind of thing. Of course, you should always be cautious about just taking other people's ideas and codes, um, because if you don't fully understand them this yourself, you don't know how to react to, to uh, the performance once it gets uh, difficult. Um, but, uh, Rich, do you know of any such service where you can have your ideas tested? Look, um, I would advise, he, he looks at some of these forums, um, these trading forums. For instance, um, the forum I used to inhabit was a forum called um, Forex Factory, which specialised in CFDs and Forex traders. And uh, you, you could find on that forum um, people with coding experience who you could basically give your ideas to, and then they'd code it up and run the test for you and uh, give you an analysis of that. Um, but look, I'm not familiar in the future space uh, where you could do that. So, um, but I'm assuming it would be available. And, um, you know, it might be as simple as um, some of these... Um, um, work, uh, what are they called? They're, they're those work providers where you basically... Um, detail what you're after and uh, then they'll come back and um, you know see if there's a consultant out there that can give that opportunity. There's a few in Australia like that, but particularly in the coding world, you'd want to find those people that were proficient in coding in the futures and um, and I'm sure it's possible. I just don't know of anything off the top of my head that I could refer him to. Uh, let me speak from some personal uh, experience uh, here, Adam. Uh, first of all, I would say I'd be incredibly cautious about um, finding anyone in a forum to do anything for you. Uh, secondly, I would say, you know, imagine you had found some really good idea, uh, giving it to a complete stranger in any event, uh, hoping that he's not going to use it for other purposes is also, I think, a little bit of a too, uh, too trusting relationship, perhaps. Um, since I'm not a coder myself or anything like that, I've always had to rely on people to do it. And I was lucky because I could find someone that I had actually worked with uh, who does uh, all of this and, and knows the CTA-specific trading strategy world when you program because it is not so easy. First of all, it is not easy to build a proper backtesting in environment yourself that is really complicated i have spent years uh working uh, on these type of of things and so they're not easy at all um there for for that you probably better off maybe buying a package that just for the for just for to do it run the numbers um and uh, and those you can certainly find and and again i don't want to endorse it because i don't know it well enough but i have heard about people things like trading blocks and trade station and stuff like that as something people go to yeah i'm not sure what else i would just say be, be really 
careful and cautious about these things. Uh, yeah. Okay. Ha- having a best one. friend that's a coder helps as well. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh, wow. That's just become so useful, hasn't it? Um, okay. Then you go on and talk about, um, okay. What is the relationship between the percentage risk per trade, i.e. half a percent per trade, and the number of markets included within the strategy's investable universe? Is it reasonable to assume that as you increase the markets traded, the risk per trade would decrease? That's in your ballpark, Rich. Yeah, so um, when when I'm um, using the risk per trade, I'm always equating it to my closed equity balance. So a percentage of risk in relation to my closed equity balance. Some people use the open equity balance. but um, So um, as you build up the number of markets, um, you you find that you can get a lot of um, exposure in leveraged instruments, and you can get uh, a lot of different um, markets and systems deployed uh, with small trade risk percentages. But you do find that the what you call a portfolio heat of the portfolio does increase. So Niels um, uh, and I um, we we use a measure. Um, that that continuously assesses the level of portfolio heat at any particular point in time that exists in our portfolio. So that is effectively the the risk if everything moved to their stop um, in an instant. Um, That basically expresses a theoretical maximum adverse risk that the portfolio could could have, but recognising that a lot of the positions in your portfolio might be hedged against each other. So whilst that's a worst case scenario, you wouldn't expect that that heat to ever be translated um, as real risk. But it is something to keep in mind that as you slowly build um, the number of systems and markets in your portfolio with your trade risk percent allocation, uh, you you the portfolio is like a risk sponge that just absorbs more and more risk. So you've got to be careful that you're choosing uncorrelated um Uh, return streams as you're building your portfolio and you don't get overexposed to any single, um, you know, positively correlated environment. Um, And uh, yeah, there is a sweet spot and you do need to keep control of your portfolio heat. Yeah, absolutely. You go on and that's uh, linked to this question. You say following on from this if one was say to say risk 1% per trade and include, say, 70 markets, it seems reasonable to assume that the hypothetical max loss of 70% could be possible if each market triggered a buy signal and eventually got stopped out. When backtesting, would you also consider the highest number of simultaneous trades? Some detailed discussion on, on the topic of risk management and position sizing would be most appreciated. Yeah, well, what I would just say here sort of briefly is that as Rich already said, I mean, you can't just say I'm going to take 70 markets and risk 1% because you, as you allude to, it's just too much potential risk. But what I can share with you is when I look at my own trend following model that we, uh, Rich and I publish the results every month on the uh, on the website, um, when I look at that, if I, I I calculate this open you know risk to stop that what is if everything gets stopped out today and that includes of course the initial stops but also the trailing stops and and so on and so forth and that tends to be somewhere between 10 and 20 percent all the time sometimes it's lower sometimes it's a little bit more than that but that is what you would expect you don't want something that suddenly says like 45 percent uh if everything gets stopped out because you don't know. I mean, it could happen and you could get slippage on top of that. So keep it conservative. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon and you have plenty of time um, ahead of you. I have a feeling you're younger than both Rich and I. So so you have plenty of time um, and uh, don't... The most important thing in trend following is to be able to fight another day. So the, the worst thing that can happen is that you, you know, lose too much uh, that it takes you too long to make back to your your, your uh, last all time high, in in my opinion. Yeah, look, just as something I'd I'd like to add there, Niels, is that the intention of diversification is effectively, it, at least in my opinion, is to reduce your trade risk to as low as you can go to basically achieve the the lowest risk exposure 
per return stream in your portfolio. So whilst a lot of people talk about um, 50 basis points or 0.5% or 1%, really they're just guidelines, but I'd be aiming to reduce it to as low as you go because the more you reduce your trade risk percentage or your allocation towards a single return stream, the more you can diversify your portfolio and achieve um, these, these, these significant benefits of diversification. So in, 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 in my opinion, it always go for the lowest you possibly can within your broker limitations. Um, and, and also as you're sort of um, immersing yourself into this trading game, always make sure you start with the lowest level before you even consider lifting your leverage um, because it's it's ideal to um, go as low as you go and go as wide as you go with your diversification before you even start considering raising your trade risk percentage across the board. Yeah. And then you go on and ask to consider changing the percentage risk per trade whenever you add a new market. Um, and, and, um, and of course, uh, as I think we've already said, you definitely need to do that. And also, if you've listened to um, my recent conversation with Jerry and, 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 and maybe the recent conversations with Jerry, when he talks about the fact that he has 200 markets in his portfolios, he's risking only 0.15% per market in total, including all of his systems, right? So that is the way he, in a sense, if everything went belly up, I mean, it's potential loss of 30%. It's not you know, 70%, right? So so you do need to take that into account. Of course, there are some different opinions uh, here on the show in terms of how many markets are enough and all of that stuff. And, you know, so that you need to work out for yourself and, and what, what you're comfortable with and what you believe in, more importantly, because if you don't believe in your system, you're never going to stick to it. Um, simple as that. Then you go on to say, a common theme has been around keeping it simple. Uh, one entry, one stop, and one stop loss. What? If any bells and whistles do you consider reasonable in addition to simple trend-following approach, uh, do your stop systems backtest endorse the use of trend regime filters such as uh, being above or being below the 200-day moving average before taking a breakout? Apart from reducing sample size, what are the benefits or weaknesses um, to such an inclusion? Do you uh, want to go first, uh, Rich, on that? Yeah, well, look, that that's a great question because yeah. th with with all of my trend followings, I, I am effectively um, applying a regime filter, and I'm doing that in many different ways. I'm either doing that through choosing a very – you know, a long-term look back with my my breakouts, which therefore means that I'm avoiding the normal everyday volatility of the market. And price has got to do something quite significant before I even entertain an entry into a trend with that model. You know, and I might use models that do use a uh, a 200 simple moving average as a regime filter uh, for a breakout. That that's a good idea. Um, ideally, what because I'm trying to target. The, the, the tail regions of that distribution of returns, I'm being very selective in the types of trend I want to participate in. So, yeah, I agree. I, I, I do look for markets to uh, start exhibiting this exotic behavior before I even get interested in them. Yeah, no, I, I, I well, you're definitely going to meet some people on the podcast who are going to say, no, 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 no. You just need the raw one entry, one exit, one stop. And, you know, in the long run, that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And actually, you could argue that in the last couple of years, those are the systems that probably performed the best because they react so quickly. And when trends start and they just continue real, real follow through, that's exactly what you want. However, there's going to be periods where that doesn't happen. And in those periods, uh, Rich is absolutely right that having some kind of filtering could be a good idea. And, um, you know, from memory, that's also how we built some of the uh, models inside the uh, TTU trend following model. There are some, you could say, filtering um, in there, or at least there are some hurdles that needs to be met before the signals, you know, are, are, are fully implemented and so on and so forth. But just be careful with it. Because what is tempting is often to add so many filters that you have very few losing trades and your drawdowns are small and everything looks great. And that's when you know that you've over-optimized, right? So 
maybe you could say as a rule, having one filter is not too bad, but don't overdo it. Stick with, be as close to classic simple trend following as possible, but we're all a little bit different. So of course, very few managers only use one stop, one entry and and, and one exit for sure. But it's still pretty robust. So um, don't discount the simplicity, I would say. All right, um, question number seven from uh, Adam. Uh, Tom Basso, uh, trend-following legend, previously comment- completed some research suggesting that the most important aspect of a system is the stop-loss methodology and position sizing slash risk management. This has was shown through a random entry system. What are the common types of stop-losses employed by your systems and what are the benefits and weaknesses of each also, have you or your guests considered a back-tested time-based stop? Um, uh, say if a trade is not profitable after X days, then exit. This could be potentially this could potentially reduce the quantum of losing trades. However, allowing another chance for an entry uh, on a re-breakout. Um, and then finally, it appears that uh, though the ATR trading stop appears to be the tool of choice, um, is there any reason for that? So what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, well, uh, it's a great question. Um, so um, there are lots of different types of trailing mechanism. Effectively, what we're saying is for our trend-following models, we don't define a profit target, but we u- do use a, a trailing mechanism uh, that basically slowly follows price as it goes in our favourable direction. But, um, you know, something such as um, a, a Donkian breakout technique using a Donkian channel, you know, the, the, um, if you're in a, a long trend, that lower Donkian tra- channel over the course of time ratchets up behind price, and that can be a fi- an effective trailing stop mechanism. Uh, but that's actually an indicator itself that's doing that. Others might be, um, you, you know... Um, I was just thinking of a few. It could be a moving average. Yeah, it could could be be a chandelier exit. Sure. And it could also be that if you're in a long trade, um, you calculate a certain distance from the most recent high. So you don't want to give back too much. Now, I know some of these things will not be popular with some of the co-hosts here on the podcast because it's not as classic trend as, as it could be. And that's fine. So you need to find, again, something that you believe in and that's something that sort of matches what you expect from your test and, of course, be open to the fact that it's not going to work out exactly as your back test uh, would say. In terms of the um, profitable days and and then time-based exits, for longer-term trend-following systems, I don't know if that's a good idea, frankly, because we're back to the loose pants uh, we actually don't care what the trend looks like. We don't have an ambition that when th- we get a signal that the signal just takes off. I mean, it would be wonderful, but it never works out that way. So even if it's, you know, just trading sideways for a month and then suddenly it shoots off. And a good example of that would be some of the recent commodity m- moves. Um, we got into oil and other commodities way before the big breakouts really happened. And they were just chugging along, not doing much, but we were long and we were ready. Um, so if you had some kind of time-based system that took you out because nothing happened in the first month, I think it would be a shame. In short-term yeah, those trading time systems... Based, those time-based uh, ones, they're effective for momentum models, but not necessarily for trend-following models. So, right, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I remember Cesar Alvarez did a big research study on uh, using time-based exits for his momentum models, and they were successful. However, for our trend-following, yeah. with, with this loose pants... Um, they don't really work very well at all as far as my research goes. No, fair enough. We've got two more questions. Let's see if we can Oh, just one thing. Uh, he, we'll do... um, yeah, I think ahead. it was Adam mentioned about ATR. Why is ATR uh, oh, a yeah. favourable me- mechanism? Well, for me, ATR is it, it, it does so many things. It's not just a, a means for um, a defining a trailing stop or an initial stop. It's also a means to normalise your markets. In other words, normalize your system to different markets. So different markets um, have different price structures, such as cryptocurrencies, such as commodities, such as Forex. But using an ATR uh, allows you to normalize all of that. So your models can be applied for any of those different markets. So using the same model for different markets. Great point. So 
Uh, we're almost at the end with Adam's questions here. Um, number eight, what is the typical relationship between the look back period adopted and the distance to the uh, stop loss? Um, it must be maybe the initial stop loss. Uh, is it commonly mentioned that longer term models are more robust in which I assume reference is made to the entry look back period? Does a longer term look back need to be matched by a longer look back for wider uh, stops? Uh, so uh, that, that's a very good question because I'm, I'm pretty, pretty pedantic on this point. So I might use long look backs, which is a way to define when I enter a trade. But um, I certainly might have, um, whilst I might delay my entry into a trend, um, when I get into that trend, I might have different you know, short-term models, medium-term models, long-term models, which will have different stops, different trailing stops applied from that entry point. So um, whilst I use long lookbacks, I don't necessarily have wide trailing stops, if that makes sense. I have a combination of different models for when I decide to participate in that trend. Yeah, and maybe, Adam, it's a good idea, uh, if you can yourself or if you find someone who can for you, is to... Uh, test this by by saying okay i'm going to use this look back period for example and then use uh run some tests with different um initial stops in terms of uh, how loose they are so to speak um, it might give you an idea uh that there is a sweet spot and i don't mean to over optimize but I also don't think you should be you know blind to the fact that if you have a longer term system but you put the stop to close you're going to get stopped out of most of your entries uh, perhaps so but i think the only way to find that out for the your specific methodology uh is to test don't necessarily go for the best as, as rich says go for a mix go for a mix of look back periods um, that's what we do uh, at the, at the on the professional side that's exactly how these things work so that we get in slowly to a trend and we get out uh, to a trend we don't do it in one go uh, at all all right final question um and we do appreciate all these questions adam by the way um you previously mentioned that you were not a fan of cross-sectional momentum models uh just keen to hear your thoughts as to why i've been considering this type of strategy it's only an idea at this stage as a good way for a small account to essentially filter a large amount of markets in order to only invest in the markets that exhibit the highest momentum. In summary, if the goal is to catch outliers, then the strategy will have to own these markets as uh, at some stage they will be showing the strongest momentum. I would couple this with ATR position sizing and trading stop. However, rotate out if another market exhibits stronger momentum at the measurement date. Would you only go long and short if uh, a minimum momentum hurdle was met? Um, i.e. momentum has to get negative in order to take short positions and positive to take a long position. Have you or your guest backtested this idea? Now, the reason I said, and I think what I'm thinking of here is this, where you say, yeah, you have maybe 50 markets, but you're not going to treat them completely individually in terms of position size. And you're going to look at how do they relative to each other stack up in terms of strength or momentum. I know people who do it, um, and maybe it can make it work for them. But I, again, keeping it simple, I like the idea of treating each in the mar each market individually so just calculating the strength for that market and and size the position of that market based on that strength not look at any other markets for an indication as to whether you should be having more or less exposure to that uh to a specific market i i just don't know uh, that it's such a great idea that's just my hunch yeah, I'm, I'm with, with you, Neil. So, you know, Gary Antonacci with the dual momentum, uh, you know, Nick Radge, I know, uses it. Um, there's a lot of different traders that successfully use cross-sectional momentum methods, but um, I'm not a fan of it um, simply because um, the mechanics of the things that I like to target, which are these things I frequently refer to as outliers, yeah. I believe is different to the mechanics of of momentum you know when you're trading these um, cross-sectional momentum methods you're saying there is some information i can gather from the level of momentum that has been um, occurred um, 
over a particular range of different markets. I will therefore assume that those with the strongest current momentum are the ones I'm going to participate in going forward. So you're making a statement based on the past momentum that you think that that level of strength and that momentum is going to continue, whether long or short. Right. Um, with the nature of these outliers that I'm capturing, there's much less information I can get about that. Um, uh, it can occur in any liquid market. There is no preferential market I'm looking for. Um, the, the, you know, we talked about these endogenous events. Uh, you know, um, the you, you can't actually necessarily identify the causal drivers of those things while you're participating in them. It might be something that you can only see in hindsight down the track. So I've got a very much more uncertain viewpoint um, of the things that I'm targeting as opposed to uh, the cross-sectional momentum boys. They both work. Um, I like mine better. I, I would always argue in preference of, of my style better, but um, I can see um, a lot of people do like this dual momentum. Yeah. I, I mean, maybe they work at different times, so to speak, uh, potentially. But on the other hand, I still get the feeling that you end up buying kind of past winners because you can only buy them when they're when it's clear that they have a high momentum. So you miss out on the period where they got to have a strong momentum. And that's what I fear, that you're actually leaving a lot of money on the table by doing so. Of course, you could potentially also leave some losses on the, ta you know, on the table, and that helps you. But I still think you should just keep it simple, especially if you're starting out. If you're starting out, don't overcomplicate and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, Adam, thank you for all your questions. Thanks for all your kind words. I hope this was helpful. I hope everyone else benefited from your questions. Um, they were very good. All right, Rich, we uh, have been going for one hour and seven minutes already, um, but we have at least one important topic that we wanted to talk about. Um, so I'm going to basically let you take over. Well, thanks, Neil. So I think that the topic I wanted to discuss today is something that you and I are involved with with our monthly reports. So um, in our monthly reports, we put together this index called the Top Traders Unplugged Trend Following Index. And I thought in this discussion, we could compare and contrast this index with some of the other popular trend following indexes, such as the SG Trend in Index and the BTOP50 Index. Uh, because there are some very important things that come out through um, looking at the nature of these different indexes. So when we look at um, the, the, the common indexes that are used by um, a lot of the fund managers, um, the uh, Societe Generale Trend Index or the SG Trend Index is a very popular index, as is the BTOP50. So the Societe Generale Trend in Index um, it's uh, it's effectively looking at the largest trend following CTAs. Um, so uh, that that are uh, trade in the managed futures space. So uh, their criteria to be included in their index is that they must be um, trading primarily futures. Uh, they must be broadly diversified. They um, <clears throat> they must be recognised as a, a trend follower by Societe Generale. Uh, they must exhibit significant correlation to trend following peers, so that therefore classifies them as a distinct grouping. And uh, they must be open to new investment and they must report returns on a daily basis. Now, the way they construct the SG trend, it's an equally weighted index that is rebalanced annually. And it's also reconstituted annually if there are any changes in who are the, the, the top 10 largest CTAs. So they're looking at the largest 10 managers with assets under management who meet all of those criteria. And so that's really an index that looks at the big boys in our space. Um, BTOP50 is another index that also looks at the big boys in our space. Even though it's called the BTOP50, there's actually in the 2022, there's actually only 20 in the index. So that's interesting, isn't it? That uh, they're using BTOP50, you'd expect them to have the 50 largest trend followers in there, but um, they're only represented by 20 currently as at 2022. But for the BTOP50, once again, uh, they're 
they're looking at the largest investable trading advisor programs um, measured by assets under management. Um, there's a, a very similar criteria to the SG trend, um, but they um, the program's advisor must have at least three years of operating history. They must have at least two years of trading activity. Um, so, uh, and the BTOP uh, 50s portfolio is equally weighted at the beginning of each calendar year. And um, as I said, they're, uh, currently they're in the, the BTOP 50. There's only 20 constituents currently in that index. So both SG Trend and BTOP 50, they're looking at the largest trend followers and they're looking at a specified number of the largest trend followers. So then we come to your and my TTU Trend Following Index. Well, let me, let, me, let me just interrupt you there. Did you say the BTOP 50 would also be looking at the largest trend followers? Because I don't see that in the sense that some of the constituents in the beta 50 index are not trend followers in my mind um and also um, some of them are very specific i mean there's one of them that is just trading net gas i mean so i yes. would say that here the constituents are more representative of the industry the managed futures industry as a whole less so trend followers yep, uh, exactly. specifically good, even though there's yeah yep, okay yep okay all right good so now in recognition of the fact that these very popular indexes uh, basically are, are looking at the big boys uh, not necessarily trend following as you say Niels uh, we decided well let's create an index ourselves of trend followers and let's not look at size as a criteria for inclusion let's look at track record so we created um, this, this index, um, which is reported in our monthly reports that we put on the blog post. And the method of construction, therefore, is not using AUM as a criteria. It's using at least a 15-year track record. So therefore, this gives the opportunity for trend following programs that are smaller, that um, have had a very long term track record of being represented in the index. And um, so to be included in the TTU tre trend following index, they must be geographically diversified across a broad array of asset classes. Um, they must be fully systematic in nature. So we're including the need for a systematic um, um, operation. Um, it also possess at least a 15-year unbroken track record. They must adopt trend-following techniques as the dominant investment strategy. They must be currently investable programs, so therefore currently active, and um, they must report on at least a monthly basis. So we are drawing this information from the Nielsen Hedge database um, who captures this information. So, of course, one of the criteria for inclusion, they must be reported by Nielsen Hedge. Uh, and our index um, is equally weighted like the other indexes, but we rebalance on a monthly basis and we reconstitute monthly as well. So um, we're looking at an inception date as well, like the others from the 1st of January 2000. And as at the 30th of April 2022, the TTU Trend Following Index had 60 programs in it, unlike the SG Trend, which has got 10, and the BTOP 50 that's currently got 20 and not necessarily trend following. So... The, the exciting thing to me is that this um, TTU trend following index is not just an index, it's actually uh, an allocation method. So, for instance, theoretically, if we had an infinite amount of funds, provided we used track record, a 15-year validated track record as our basis for it, um, selecting all of our funds, we would be selecting all funds that meet that criteria, at least a 15-year track record. So we're not applying any form of selection bias in the index itself, apart from it must have this validated track record. And what we find, which is exciting to me at least, is that when you compare and contrast the three different indexes, we find that the TTU trend following index clearly outshines both the BTOP50 and the SG trend, both in terms of its compound annual growth rate and in terms of its um, drawdown. And <clears throat> you and I, Niels, um, in, in our monthly report, 
um, we we offer a solution for those people with limited capital, um, which we call a serenity allocation, which is our way when dealing with um, uh, you know traders with a limited amount of capital. How can they get exposure to a diversified group of trend followers? Well, by using the serenity ratio, that allows us to work within that limited capital constraint. But the TTU trend following index is theoretically, if you had unlimited capital, what would you want to invest in? Would you select any of those individual programs within um, that um, that listing? Well, it turns out that if you invest uh, equally weighted into the entire index itself, it produces um, the optimal risk weighted returns of any possible se selection within that index itself. So it's it's a it really demonstrates to me, Niels, the, the power of diversification because what we're saying is that if we invested theoretically into 60 of these programs that demonstrated this long-term track record, the first thing is it's saying to me the validated track record is the best form of risk metric we have available. You know, a lot of people use Sharp, a lot of people use Sortino, a lot of people use Mar, a lot of people use Serenity Ratio, but, but the real ultimate form of measure of robustness is the track record itself. It speaks loudly in terms of this trend following index. The second thing is that if I invest in all of these trend following fund managers without getting into any form of selection bias, I get a fantastic result by virtue of the diversification benefits achieved through um, exposure to 60 of these trend following programs. And each of these programs themselves is highly diversified. So what this is saying is when we sort of almost apply infinite levels of diversification through applying the index, we get an even better result than selecting any of the individuals within it. And the other thing is that each of these different programs have their own inherent different systematic methodologies, different systems. So therefore, we're also getting massive diversification of systems by investing in the entire index. Now, I, I often look at this, this trend following index, and I know a lot of people say, oh, it's just an index, but it's much more than that. It, it, it loudly speaks to all of the things we've discussed over this this podcast over so many years, the powers of diversification, the powers of trend following. And another thing is, I, I noticed that the index itself, the TTU trend following index, its drawdown since the year 2000 to current day is only 18%. And its compound annual growth rate is about 8.57%. So let's compare that to uh, let's compare that to the S and P 500, which has got uh, I think um, over that period of time, if I look at it, it's around about 6.5 percent CAGR, but a 50 percent drawdown for the S and P 500. Any of the individual trend following programs within that index is going to have a higher drawdown, and they're probably going to have a lower compound annual growth rate as well. But by by investing in the entire ensemble of everything on offer that is that's the best solution so what do you think well i mean it's a great and it's very compelling story uh of course for some um putting a hundred thousand dollars in 60 managers is not impossible right six million dollars but maybe there's an institution out there thinking wow that's pretty good maybe i should contact uh, nails and rich and and uh, and actually build the ttu trend following index and and so if you are sitting out there and with that in mind you should contact uh, me or rich for sure and um, these are powerful um, themes even though we might make them sometimes sound too simple but they're not because as as rich you rightly say underneath there's a lot going on that we talk about all the time. And here's a way for us to visualize for for the audience um, what that looks like. At least it tells me as well that uh, there's an opportunity for a clever person out there to create an ETF that mimics that index. And um, I could imagine... Yeah, the ETF world, uh, Rich, it's not so easy once you get into the ETF world. I would, uh, I would stick with offshore. It's really not that easy. Um, but anyway, we don't have time to <laughs> discuss why it's not so easy to do these things, um, but uh, not today at least. So yeah, just some inspiration for people, I, I hope, 
And of course, we don't know, uh, we should say that, we don't know if all of these 60 programs are offered as an offshore fund where you can put in 100,000. Many of them will be, but not necessarily all of them. But they, you know, but you could probably invest in them as far as we can tell, um, in, in, in most of them at least. So you could get pretty close uh, in, in reality. Rich, this has been awesome, um, but I do think we need to leave the next topic for next time or for some kind of bonus thing we might do. Um, and by the way, if people were to produce the TTU index as a product, they would have Rich write the monthly report automatically. Yes, that's, that's right. one of the things <laughs> I'd have to accept. <laughs> that's a little added benefit <laughs> because that's exactly what we do. Uh when we publish it each month. Anyways, um, we talked a little bit about May numbers, um, or we talked about May in general, and, and we talked about the numbers being a little bit soft. But maybe now that we've talked about the constituents of these two in of some of these indices, people will better understand why they're different. So, for example, the B Top 50 index was up 48 basis points in uh, May, uh, up 15% uh, so far this year. But the Shokgen CT index um, was down 10 basis points, up 19 and a quarter percent this year. And the SG trend index was down 32 basis points, but up 25.58% so far this year. But if you think about the fact that the B top 50 index, for example, I'm just, I don't know exactly if this is true or not, but there is this, for example, a net gas trader in there and i know some of these net gas programs are up like a hundred and something percent in the last 12 months so even if you just have one of the 20 uh, uh constituents being a net gas trader it does make a difference um so maybe that what it, it explains the month by month uh, differences in returns um maybe also finally to note that the sg uh, short-term traders index uh, was up 82 basis points in may up nine and, and a half in uh Year to date, and then finally the MSAI World Index, uh, as a reference, is down 16 basis points in May, uh, down 13.64%, um, and also the world government bonds were down again in May, down 71 basis points. I think they're down like 8.2% uh, so far this year, uh, and the S&P was flat uh, last month. Anyway, speaking of flat, my trend barometer is pretty flat at the moment. It's 45, which is neutral, um, so not expecting any deviance from from that so my plus minus one or two percent for most managers in in may is what i would expect to see i think that's about it for today um i hope you um, got some value from all of these questions we appreciate them uh, feel free to uh, continue to send in your questions um if you like what you hear uh, of course we would uh, love for you to share the podcast with your friends and your colleagues and your families but also to leave a rating and review in uh, iTunes and on Spotify because they really, really do help. Next week, uh, Rob Carver is back. Um, so uh, it'll be great to tackle some more questions with him. He always have, he has, of course, a different uh, view of looking at things. Um, so uh, so that's always fun. You can either email them to info at toptradersonblog.com. From Rich and me, Thanks ever so much for listening and we look forward to being back with you next week. Until that time, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.